Well, thank you for uh, letting me kind of set the tone for where we're headed here uh, with this session or today. And uh, we're going to kind of keep going with simple, basic stuff that's life-changing, which that kind of works for me. Um, I, like it to, I like to get things down to what's the bottom line? What do we need to think? How, what's, what's the basics, um, foundational kinds of ways of thinking? To me, that makes sense, and so I like to narrow things down that way. And we're going to be doing that some more in this session. So... In the 1960s, there was um, a, a child psychologist who came up with the famous marshmallow test. There may be somebody who even knows about the marshmallow test. But uh, the marshmallow test was famous because it involved, um, it was testing children's capacity to resist temptation. And uh, then kind of looking at the importance of delayed gratification and how children responded to that. So in the test, basically what it was is they took younger children, like um, usually around five, six, seven. So they were younger kiddos, and they, they brought them into this room, and uh, the, the test, the, the man said, okay, and so there's the, the kiddo is seated, seated at the table, and on the table is a plate with a marshmallow on it. And uh, he said, you may have this marshmallow. You may eat it at any time, but I'm going to leave the room, and if you don't eat that marshmallow for the 15 minutes while I'm gone, I will give you two marshmallows when I come back. And so he would ask them, do you understand? And so kiddos, yes. And so then for some of the kiddos, before he'd even left the room, they'd grab that marshmallow and they were already licking it or eating it or putting it in their mouths. And then there were other kiddos who um, they would sit there and he would leave the room. And then they're, you know, most kiddos are not used to being left in a room by themselves with a marshmallow anyway. And then to be left there and be told, you can eat it at any time, or if you want another one, all you have to do is just wait. So they would look there, and here's this little child seated, seated at this table, and there's this marshmallow there. And so some of them would look at it, and then they poke at it, <laughs> and then some of them would pick it up and smell it. There was this one little girl, you can watch this on YouTube, from the original test subject. She sniffed it, and sniffed it, and sniffed it. She sniffed that thing. I was like, goodness, is she going to be okay? And then, um, and then there was other, other ones, they would lick it and put it back down. And then they'd pick it up lick it, and then there's other little ones, you know, a little bite. One little girl kind of carved it out from the middle and then turned it around so that they wouldn't see that she'd eaten the middle. <laughs> and then there were the children who didn't, and uh, who didn't eat the marshmallow. And uh, for a couple of them, they, they looked at it and then for most of them, they, they kind of shifted their body so they're not seeing it, so they wouldn't be tempted. And it was um, these children that when they came back, they said, oh, you didn't eat the marshmallow. And it's like, no, I wanted two of those marshmallows. <laughs> but these kiddos, they, there was enough, and they understood temptation enough of their own hearts that they were able to delay that gratification of a marshmallow for 15 minutes, which is an eternity when that marshmallow is looking you in the face. I don't know what I, even today, like for me, <laughs> I love marshmallows. And so if I was sitting in a room for 15 minutes 
I don't know, I probably would have been sniffing it and licking it and before and along kind of um, going along there. But I think that story and that test is fascinating because what it illustrates is um, just even what temptation is like and what we, how we think about temptation and, and even how to hold out against temptation. And as believers, we don't talk about temptation very much, do we? Like, when was the last time you sat there and had, like, how you doing today? Been tempted on anything that you want to tell me about? You know, we, it's not necessarily how we're talking with one another, but truly, we should. And um, because if we need to gain a right understanding about temptation, and sin so we can walk rightly before the Lord. And so in this session, what we want to talk about is how to unstick the stuck when we are stuck in, uh, in things and when, how do we respond when we feel tempted to sin. And we want to discover the resources that God gives us so that when we are tempted, we won't fall into sin, that there's a difference between them. And oftentimes, when we are dealing with temptation, it's also in the midst of trials or difficulties or pressures, right? I mean, we're, most of the time, um, we can feel temptation to fall into sin, but usually it's when there's heightened emotions or uh, there's extra pressure upon us. And, and that's when we're f feeling more tempted to, I'm just going to blow. You know, those kinds of things where we're, I feel like I'm going to lose it. Children, run for cover because mommy's going to lose it. You know, those kinds of things. Um, when is that? Because there's pressure or uh, trials or uh, afflictions that are coming along, it, along. And so we're in the midst of that. And that's when there's that extra temptation to give way to fear or anger or worry or bitterness or pride or unbelief or any other kind of sin. And yet, what we want to discover here is that there is never a time in our lives when we can't live by faith. There's never a time in our lives as believers when we can't obey the Lord. For a believer, we can always obey God. And we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. But to get it just a quick running jump into the text, what we see here is at the end of chapter 9, at the very end, Paul has been talking about in, in 1 Corinthians 9, just why he tailors his life the way he did, you know, why he lived that narrowed down life. And he says at the end of 1 Corinthians 9 in verses 26 and 27, this is why I run the way, in such a way, you know, I do it because I want to have aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul is just explaining that more than anything, he doesn't want anything to get in the way of his onward journey toward heaven. And so he, everything in his life is, is tailored so that he will not fall into sin. And then as he goes into chapter 10, he gives an example of those who did fall into sin because of their unbelief. They would not believe in God's word. And so he gives the example of the Israelites and how time and time again, they would not believe God. And it disqualified them from entering into the rest that God had for them. But as we come to the end of that sec section in 1 Corinthians 10, if you look at verse 12, 
So Paul explains, here's the, the Israelites. They, they would not believe God. They wouldn't believe God. Here's all the things that they did. And they are examples for us. And then verse 12, we come here, and it's kind of just the, the culmination of what Paul has been talking about because he says that if we think that we are any different is basically what he's saying in verse 12. If you think that you won't fall into unbelief like the Israelites, then you're in trouble. That's what he's telling us in verse 12. That if you think you are not going to fall into sin, if you think you're going to be standing, you need to take heed. That's what he's telling us in verse 12. And that sets us up perfectly for our first point, which is everyone experiences temptation, which I think is just huge. Now, that's kind of basic, isn't it? Um, but in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10, we're told, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And the rest of the verse says, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. And what we see is 1 Corinthians 10, 13 opens with this life-saving, heart-bolstering, mind-straightening truth that no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, which is basically just saying everybody deals with temptation. This is, I think, super encouraging, isn't it? So that means just look around the room that little sweet lady that's sitting right next to you who you think she would never deal with the temptations I've been dealing with. Well, she might not be dealing with your temptations, but she's got them. That's what verse one or verse 13 is telling us. No one is without temptation. Everyone has dealt with it. So we're all in here together. We might as well lock arms because we're all in it together. Temptation does not care how old you are. You can be 11, you can be 60, you can be 98, it's not gonna matter. You can be a little girl, you can be a middle girl, you can be an old girl and you're gonna still deal with temptation. It doesn't matter if you're single, if you're married, if you work, if you don't work, if you're a homeschool mom or a not homeschool mom, you can still be tempted. It doesn't matter if you are rich, if you are poor, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you know how to knit or not. <laughs> you can still be tempted. And everyone has experience with temptation, which is also something that's helpful to remember. We are all experts at temptation. It's not just theory. And if anyone tells you, oh, I've never been tempted, then you just, it's almost like, no, you are lying. Because every single one of us, that's what verse 13 tells us. The truth from God's word is Everyone is an expert at temptation. Notice I'm not saying sin. I'm saying everyone has experienced temptation. But because we've all experienced temptation, then we know how quickly temptation can jump into sin. Right? We know that. We've experienced that. And we know from Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all experts at giving way to temptation. And at one time or another, we've probably all eaten the marshmallow. We know um, just over and over again in the scriptures what is like, and we've seen it in the scriptures where people have described 
eating the marshmallow, giving way to sin. Uh, in Joshua 7.21, Achan dis- details his descent into sin when he said, I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, and I coveted them, and I took them, and then I concealed them in the earth inside my tent with the silver under it. He, he's talking about the things that we do in our hearts. We look, and then we covet, and then we hide it, and we give way to sin. We see over and over again all these examples in the scriptures about people giving way to sin, and We also know from James chapter 1 in verses 13 through 15 that we are responsible before the Lord when we do give way to sin. In fact, James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So we're each responsible for our own response to temptation and sin. We can't blame it on anyone else. You know, it's not his fault or her fault or the devil made me do it. No, temptation and falling into that, um, the sin from the temptation is our responsibility. That's what James chapter 1 teaches us. We um, see that the temptation to sin is for us to t- own and to understand and uh, go before the Lord. John Owen describes temptation as anything that for any reason exerts a force of influence to seduce and draw the mind and heart of man from the obedience of God, that we would sin at any level. That's a great um, definition, isn't it? William Gurnall describes temptation this way. Temptation is temptation and sin is sin. And I love that he starts out his definition that way. We're going to talk some more a little bit about the rest of it. But for us to understand, temptation is different than sin. Does temptation lead into sin? Yes. But you can have temptation and not have it jump into sin. And this is what we want to spend time on today. William Gurnall went on to say, Christian... This is imperative for you to realize. When wicked or unclean thoughts first force their way into your mind, you have not yet sinned. This is the work of the devil. But if you so much as offer those thoughts a chair and begin polite conversation with them, you will become the devil's accomplice. In only a short time, you will give these thoughts sanctuary in your heart. Your resolve not to yield to a temptation you are already entertaining. It is no match for Satan and the longings of the flesh. Temptation is temptation, and sin is sin. They're different, and you can look temptation in the face and then apply faith from the word of God and turn your back on that temptation. Or you can look temptation in the face and say, too much for me. Eat the marshmallow and there you go. So those are the choices that we have. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13 gives us the tools to say no to the temptation to fall into sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells that everyone faces temptation. And so though everyone faces it, we're not destined to fall into sin. And that is a hope that is not available to anyone outside of Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you have hope that you don't have to fall into sin, though you may experience temptation. This is huge. This 
is life changing because this changes how we live when we're in the trenches and you are trying to be patient in how you're speaking to your little children, those little cherubs, those little darlings who are trying your patience for the 65th time today. You know what I'm talking about. In that moment of temptation, you can look that temptation in the face and say no to losing your temper for the 66th time and the 67th and the 68th. Because we know from Hebrews 2.18 that Jesus can help us because he was tempted in, that, in all that he suffered and he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Ah. <gasps> Good news. There's good news for us, isn't there? Hebrews 4.15 tells us that we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have a high priest who has been tempted in all things as we are, and yet he never sinned. Jesus experienced temptations just like we do, but he experienced them to the greater degree because he never sinned. I experience temptation, but I fall into sin. My Jesus never did. He is the expert at holding out. He waited way longer than 15 minutes. And we can go to him for help. That's what we see here. Jesus didn't give in to the temptation to speak unkindly. Jesus didn't give in to the temptation to be angry. Jesus never gave in to sexual fantasies, to envy the blessings that God gives to others, to not believe God's promises. When Jesus was tempted to complain of his weariness, he trusted God to protect him, to provide for him, to prepare him for whatever lay ahead. Jesus kept trusting God. When the crowds turned against him, when they jeered at him and laughed at him, when they abandoned and rejected him, when they fawned over him to gain something, when they were ungrateful and proud and unbelieving, Jesus never gave in to the temptations that came upon him. Temptation came at Jesus, and he experienced those temptations coming at him, coming toward him, but he didn't entertain them. And that's the difference. Temptation comes at us. You feel those things. You know what that's like when those, and the Bible describes them as these flaming missiles that come at us and they're ping, ping, ping. And there's times when it feels like they're coming at us in a barrage. But Jesus didn't ever take those flaming missiles and then say, would you like to sit and chat? Let's talk about this. It's when we want to sit and chat with our temptations that they turn into sin. And we know from Romans 13, 14, that it says that we are not to make provision for our flesh in regard to its lust. And next session, we're going to be talking about that very thing, of how not to make provision for our flesh. When we look at Jesus and see his response to temptation, then we can have hope that options are available to us, that we don't have to give way to sin. There is a way out. Yes, everyone faces temptation. And as we come to our second point here, we see that God is faithful to help us in temptation. Verse 13 says, No temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful. God is faithful. That one truth should be enough to embolden us in our faith. It's enough to help us against the devil's schemes. God is faithful. That phrase Paul put in the middle of his teaching on temptation to encourage us. Yes, temptation is for everything. Everyone has experienced it, but what do we know? 
God is faithful. And then he gives us more information about the Lord. We learn from Deuteronomy 7, 9. The Lord is your God. He is God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness. Psalm 33, 4, we learn this about the Lord, that the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Isn't that fabulous? God is faithful. And what we see in the scriptures over and over again is that God himself tells us, I am the faithful God. And so if you are tempted, you can trust me. That's why that is put in the middle of this verse. We can trust him. God will keep his promises to help us. We can rely on him, and we know that what God has said, he will do. Psalm 28, 7. I have been so enjoying the meat from this verse for months now. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Is that basic or what? How fabulous is that? My heart trusts in you, Lord, and guess what? I am helped. Very simple, and in the moment of temptation, my heart, it trusts in you, Lord. I'm struggling against my sin right now, but I believe that you will help me. Psalm 28, 7 tells me that, but 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells me, you are faithful. And so what we see as we continue to go through 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 10, 13, is now we have a list of ways that God helps us because he is faithful. So our first is a uh, 2A. Um, it's a, the phrase of how God will help us when we are tempted. Our faithful God, who is faith, faithful and will help us, he will not... what. Allow us to be tempted beyond what you are able. Beyond what you are able. Such an interesting little phrase. The New um, American Standard, the New King James Version, and the Holman Christian Standard Bibles all say beyond what you are able. The ESV uh, translates that he will not let you be tempted beyond what your ability kind of adds a little bit of extra thing. The New International Version says he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. The Net Bible says he will not let you be tried beyond what you are able to bear. And the New Living Translation says he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when we take all those translations together, because they all add a little bit of extra nuance, what we see is that because God is faithful, then we can test, trust him when temptation comes upon us. That's what the, all those versions teach us, that we can rest because God will not allow the temptations to overtake us Temptation can be powerful, but it is not all powerful. Who is more powerful than temptation? God. And so God says that he will not allow the temptation to be more than we are prepared for spiritually. God will help us. We are never victims of temptation. And our temptations are never more that we can stand or bear because we always have the option to say no because our God is faithful to help us. And this is so important for us to understand when we come face to face with our fleshly desires. When you're sitting there at the little table and there's the marshmallow, whatever your marshmallow might be for that day, whether it's uh, fear or unbelief 
or depression or discouragement or bitterness or unforgiveness, the range of emotions, the range of responses of sins, whatever it is, is not too much for us to say, Lord, you are faithful. Your word is enough. And I am tempted right now to give way to my pity party. I love my pity parties. But Lord, I also love you more. And I don't want to have a pity party today. I want to give you glory. Will you help me to not give way? See, that's, the, that's what the beauty is of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. When we are in the midst of our trials, when there's pressure that has come upon us, when we're in the midst of difficulty, and there's all kinds of temptations for us to give way to fear, to anger, despair, then we need to remember God is faithful, and he will not allow that trial, that pressure, that difficulty, that affliction, and that temptation that is right there nipping at our heels. It's not going to be more than we can stand because he always helps us to obey. And this is hugely freeing for us, isn't it? Because it shows us that even when our circumstances and our battles feel like they're too much for us. And sometimes they do, don't they? This is so tempting. And our flesh, we can feel our flesh that desires to give way. I just want to let it all out. And we can feel that temptation. It can feel very powerful. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, it is not more than you can bear. Not because you are so strong and so powerful that you can fight your flesh, but because God is faithful. And so if we entrust ourselves to the Lord and look for his rescue, we will find the help we need. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 gives us hope. And if you are facing trials that introduce those temptations to sin in your life. And they, they can be trials like, I just have this huge pile of laundry and it's making me feel grumpy. I mean, that can be, it can be that trial. Or it can be, um, my husband has just lost his job. I have no idea how we're going to pay the bills. And I'm tempted to fear and lash out. You know, it can run the gamut of things. But 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us that there's always a way of escape. But we must reorient our thinking that we can exercise faith in every situation. God has allowed us to go through these things, these pressures, these trials, these difficulties. And though we might be tempted in them, God has given us the way of escape, that, that it's not too much for us. Because whenever we apply faith, we also have the opportunity to obey, don't we? You know, oftentimes when we are going through uh, different trials, different difficulties, when we're feeling tempted, we can feel like a leaf that's kind of in a whirlpool. And it's just, it's just what's going to happen to me. You know, I'm stuck. I can't give way. I'm tempted. And the next thing that happens is I'm just going to lose it and I'm going to lose my temper or whatever. No. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that God oversees and superintends our lives. And so he knows about the, our temptations. He knows. He knows about what's going on in our hearts. And he knows that in that moment, we want to give way to sin. And yet, it will not be beyond what we are able to bear if we remember he is faithful. We always have the resources that we need if we want to obey God. Now, we may still choose to sin, 
and we do. Um, but entertaining the sin or entertaining the temptation, uh, the temptation will always ensure that we sin. And so what we need to do is begin to slow things down in our minds at least so that we can see at what point that is when we begin to entertain temptation so that we will not fall into sin. We need to know um, that if we want to battle our sins and weaknesses and temptations in our own strength, we're we're lost. We will give in. But if we remember that God is faithful, then we will have his power, his strength to obey him, to believe his word, to apply his promises to our lives. So when we're in the midst of temptations, we have to remember that God is faithful. He's faithful to his character. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful because he loves his children. And he doesn't leave us to ourselves to figure it out. He's not mean. He's a loving father who wants his children to obey. He wants us to obey way more than we want to obey. You know that, right? He wants us to obey him, and he helps us and gives us the resources that we need so we can stand firm, so that our lives look different. I love that. I love how simple that is, and yet how life-changing it is. So if God is faithful and he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear or have been prepared for spiritually, then why do we still fall into and succumb to temptation? I think the number one answer is because we want to. <laughs> no, that's the truth, isn't it? We just want to give way to sin. And in our next section, uh, session, we're going to talk a little bit more about that because we, we want to satisfy our own desires. We like those desires and we want to give in to those desires and so we do give in to those desires because we'd rather give in to our fleshly desires than to honor the Lord. So... Why do we succumb to our temptations? Because we want to. Another reason that we give in to our temptations, even though God is faithful and he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we are spiritually prepared for, is simply that we will not believe God. We don't believe his word. We don't believe that there's a way out. We would rather believe the lies that we are stuck, that we're hindered and thwarted, and that we can't have a um, a different outcome. My uh, hubby has said, it would ungod God if he were to break even a single promise. He cannot violate his word. He must follow through. He may not fulfill his promise according to our timetable and in our way, but he must keep his word or he cannot be God. This should be a great comfort to us knowing that the God who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all will indeed freely give us all things, answer our prayers, grant us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and a thousand other things promised to believers because his word says so and he is the God who cannot lie. Another reason we give in to our temptations even though God is faithful and won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we are prepared for is simply that we are not equipped to fight our temptations. We've never thought that we could fight against them. I mean, most of the time we just think temptation, sin. Temptation, sin. Temptation, sin. How about this? Temptation, temptation. Wonder Woman, hey, you know, get them. They're coming at you, the temptations. God says that we can fight against temptation. But sometimes we forget that. It's time for us to get trained, is what this is talking about. 
We're told in Hebrews 5.14 that mature believers live upon the solid word, a solid food of God's word. And it is through constant practice and the use of it that they grow in discernment in distinguishing good and evil. That is a perfect example of what happens as we learn to fight against temptation is through applying God's word and the constant practice of applying God's word that we grow in discernment so that we can distinguish between good and evil. Temptation is coming. That's a bad thing. I don't want to fall into that. I'm going to apply the word of God. And as we continue to do that, we grow in maturity and wisdom in applying God's word. So basic, but so life-changing, isn't it? John Owen said, blessed is he who is prepared for such a season of temptation. There is no escape without preparation. We have to be women who are prepared. Another question that we need to answer is, if God is faithful and he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear or that we've been prepared for, then what possible good can come from undergoing temptation? Why would God even let us experience temptation? I mean, if he's so powerful and so faithful, then he could certainly just remove it all and just let us skate through life and we'd never have to go through it and it'd be so much nicer, wouldn't it? Easier, great, except that God allows us to undergo temptations to teach us to obey. And then when we learn to obey, we are blessed in our obedience Psalm 119.67, the psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Temptation teaches us the blessing of obedience. God allows us to undergo temptations because it shows us our hearts. It reveals how much we really love the Lord. John 14.15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so when we undergo temptation, then it shows us our hearts. God allows us to undergo temptations to show us our weak areas so that we will rely on the Lord and not on our own strength. When we are weak, he is strong, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. John Owen says, testing allows man to see clearly what is truly in him and what type of metal he is made of. God allows us to undergo temptations to strengthen our faith and cause us to grow in wisdom and maturity. When we say no once, we can learn to say no again. It builds strength in us. John Owen says, The preciousness of a medicine is revealed by the presence of the disease. We will not know the power of grace until we feel the power of testing. We must be tried to realize the glory of being preserved. And we see the second point, or point to be, God provides a way of escape from temptation. Verse 13, that God, it says that because God is faithful, he will not allow you to be tempted or tried beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. God is able to help his children. And what we see is that God places himself and puts himself in the place of being our deliverer. God loves to deliver his children from trials and afflictions. Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the, the righteous. And temptation is an affliction. When we're feeling that, we can feel very beleaguered by those things. And yet, Psalm 34, 19 says, the Lord delivers him out of them all. We see that God is to us a God of deliverances, Psalm 68, 20. And to God the Lord belong escapes from death. Point C 
because God is faithful, he helps you persevere against temptation. And I love how at the end of the verse, it says that God will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. And there's such uh, treasures here in this last little bit that there is never a time when we are tempted where we can't choose to obey. There's never a time in temptation when there isn't an option for us to turn to the Lord in faith and believe his promises. Our text teaches us that God will help us overcome our temptations. Enduring the temptations means facing them, though, and going through them. You know those times when the doctor says, this is going to hurt a lot, but if you just hold out a couple minutes, I won't have to give you a shot. And so you think, okay, well, I can hold out a couple minutes. I can hold out. And then it's like, but it's only a couple minutes. And so you, you get through. Well, that's what this verse is teaching us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That God will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Yes, it's gonna, you're going to deal with the temptation. You're going to have to say no to that. But as you endure not giving way to sin you will get through it. You will come out on the other side. That's what this verse is teaching us. Our text teaches us that, you, that if you hold out against temptation, you will come out on the other side without having fallen into sin. And you know what that is like? That's like, yes, yes. With, I didn't fall into sin, right? And we're, it's the victory dance. Jesus, thank you for helping me. Dear Father, I'm so glad I didn't give way to sin. You're going to be tired. You're going to be humbled. But you will be full of praise to the Lord for his grace and help in helping you withstand your own flesh. William Grinnell said, you can be absolutely certain that no sin is powerful enough to overwhelm God's strength. Do I need to say that again? Isn't that the best blessing? There is no sin powerful enough to overwhelm God's strength. Christ never lost a battle with sin, even when he lost his life. He battled against heaven, or he battled with a temptation all the way to heaven until he crossed the river of death and accomplished what he had been sent here to do. But he never gave, gave way to the temptation to not believe God. He believed God's promises. And so we need to consider how far will you go to give God glory in your life? Will you believe him all the way past the temptation to the point that it's not tempting anymore because the Lord has so delivered you? My friend Chris Gertson said, let's be stubborn for his glory. I'm going to be stubborn against this temptation to give way to sin. I'm going to say no to that because I want to go all the way through in believing God. I don't want to give way to sin. Have there been times when you've prayed that? I'm sure you have. Lord, I'm so tempted right now to give way to my flesh. Please help me to give you glory right now. I don't want to be bitter and unforgiving. Help me. And does he? Absolutely. When we look to him for help. The way of escape is different every single time. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 doesn't tell us what that will be, but we know that God provides the way of escape. No trial has overtaken you that has not been faced by others. God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you are able to bear, but with the trial will provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. 
We are never stuck. That's what this verse is teaching us. We have options. We can always obey the Lord. We can always op- apply faith. And that God will help us because he is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is not really about temptation, is it? It's about the God who helps us in the midst of temptation. And it gives us the resources that we need when we feel thwarted and hindered and kind of stuck. But we are not victims of temptation. That's what this verse is all about. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible look at this verse, which really is a look at you. Oh, Father, how incredible you are, how kind you are to your children, that you give us everything we need for life and godliness. Lord, we want to say no to temptation more and not give in to sin. Help us, Lord, to so prize honoring you that we would endure our temptation until it is no longer temptation because our eyes are fastened on you, the faithful one. We're looking to you to escape that temptation, Lord, so that we would not fall into sin. So you would be put on display that our lives would be different and you would get the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.